Hello, Math412. Thank you again for the flexibility to do this. And so let's get into it. Um, we're going to be talking about external direct products. Let me share my screen. So here we go. So external direct products. <clears throat> so the essential idea of where we're going is we've built up all this machinery to uh, explore what groups are. We know cyclic groups, we know abelian groups, we know some non-abelian groups, and we come up with some examples. But the idea is that actually we there is a way to kind of build a bunch of new groups from old groups. And the idea is we're going to use, so idea, use Cartesian products, Cartesian products, and use group structure, use group operation, operation component-wise, component-wise, <clears throat> component-wise. And so the idea is that if you have to, given two groups, you know, so let's think about two groups that we know. Um, for instance, uh, R, and then if you take any Cartesian product of R with R, so in the first component you have R and the second component you have R, and let's say we're doing it with addition, then the idea is that this as a set is just coordinates, A, B, um, where A comes from R and B comes from, right? The first and second components are, are real numbers. A, B, R, L, and some R. And the idea is you add, you add them component-wise. Add, add component-wise. So add component-wise, component-wise. And this is what we call R2. So R2, we're already familiar with this as a vector space, right? R2 is just all pairs of points where one, the each one is a real number and you can add them component-wise. This is a vector space and therefore it's it's a group. It's an abelian group. Um, and you can do this for any amount of Rns. And so the idea is that instead of having R in each component, you could put any group in those components and you can have multiple components. Just like Rn is, is an n-tuple, we can have n groups for each component. And so that's the idea of an external direct product. And this word external, so I'll, I'll give a little kind of um, talk about this, but the idea is that external, the reason why we call it an external direct product is to really emphasize the fact that it's something, it's an outside structure we're putting on two groups, as opposed to what we're going to talk about in chapter nine, which is an internal direct product, which is almost like flipping our viewpoint where it's the idea is you look at a group and see how, how it can be built out from smaller groups. We're instead going to take small groups and just say, let's just build bigger groups out of them by just kind of combining them together in, in Cartesian products. It turns out that that's actually isomorphic to saying how a group can be built up from smaller pieces. And so it turns out that external and indirect and internal direct products are isomorphic to each other. But in the beginning, we're gonna we're gonna emphasize their difference. And so we'll call this an external direct product. And so what's the definition? Given n groups G1 through Gn, the ex and so we're gonna do this with finite collections, by the way. We you could define an external direct product on an infinite thing but it would require us to define what an infinite product is. And so we're not gonna do that. So we're just gonna do finite external products. The external direct product of those groups written as, and we're gonna use a O plus. So an O plus is gonna be the symbol we use between them. <clears throat> so G1, O plus, G2, O plus, or direct sum, Gn is the set of all n tuples. So you take all possible n tuples where the ith component is an element from G sub i. And so in symbols, G1, direct sum, G2, direct sum, all the way to Gn. It's just tuples where G1, G2, Gn, the, the ith component comes from the ith group, right? And what's the operation? So if I have G1, G2, dot, 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 Gn, and I multiply it by H1, H2, dot, 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 Hn, then that by definition is just do component-wise. So it's just G1, H1, G2, H2, dot, 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 G, N, H, N. So you just do the operation on each component. So the operation, the operation is component-wise, is component-wise, component-wise. And so as I said before, we've seen some examples. R, N is a direct sum. So, so R, N <clears throat> is actually isomorphic, or actually it's equal to R, direct sum r, direct sum r, dot, 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 direct sum r, n times. 
n times mm -hmm. and so that's that's basically from vector space stuff you just do addition component wise and so it is i guess i should put an o plus there too but that's how we will um kind of think about it <clears throat> let's do a, a simpler example or maybe not a simpler example but a finite example um using groups that we know <clears throat> so let's do u8 direct sum u10 and let's think about it as a set for a second <clears throat> so a reminder of what u8 is u8 is one three seven oh five seven <clears throat> And U10 is uh, 1, 3, uh, 5, 7, no, not 5, sorry, 1, 3, 5, 9. 3, 5, 9. I believe that's it. Yes. Mm -hmm. 1, 3, 5, 9. And so the idea is this set is going to have all possible Cartesian products. So as a set, you take 1 and you take 1, you do 1 and um, 3. You do one and five. Oh, this is not five. This should be a seven. Sorry. This should be a seven. <clears throat> one and a five. Uh, so not one and a five. It should be one and a seven. And then one and a nine. And so those are all the ones that start with one. And then you do all the ones that start with three. So three and a one. Three and a three. And you have a five. Or sorry, three and a seven. <clears throat> And you have uh, three and nine. And you do all the ones that start with five. So you have five and one, five and three, five and seven, and five and nine. And then finally, you have all the ones that start with seven. So seven and one, seven and three, seven and seven, and seven and nine. <clears throat> and so it's just the Cartesian product U8 comma U10. But then the group structure, for instance, if I do one, one times one, one, that's just equal to one, one, right? It's one in each component. So one, one is the identity. Um, if I did one, uh, let's do five, three, <clears throat> five comma three times five comma three, well, you do five times five in U8, which is one, and then three comma three in that and u10 is nine. And so it's one nine. And then you could do five comma three times uh, one nine. And that's gonna be five. And then nine times three is 27, so seven. And then we could do five three times one nine. And that equals five, oh, sorry, <laughs> times five seven. I don't know why I did one nine again. It should be times five seven because I'm trying to figure out what the order of five three is. Twenty five is one, <clears throat> and then seven times three is one, and so five three. The order of five three is equal to four, right? It has order four because I had to multiply by itself four times, whereas the order of five only has order two, but the order of three in U ten, three times three was nine, three times nine was seven, and three times seven is one, and so there's some relationship between the order of that guy and the order of that guy. Because in u, because order of five is equal to two in u ten u eight, and order of three equals four in u ten, but the order of their pair five comma three is equal to four in u in the in their uh, direct product u eight direct product u ten. <coughs> And so there's some relationship. Let's think about Z2 comma Z3. What is this as a set? Also, let's real quick notice the number of things in here. The number of things, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, which is exactly the order of this guy times the order of that guy. And so the order of the cross, the Cartesian product, right, is just the order of each individual um, group times each other. And so we'll record that real quick. This is equal to the order of u8 times the order of u10, which equals 16. And so by that logic, this one will have order six. And so there should be six things. There's 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and then 1, 0, 
one, one, and one, two. And that's all six elements, right? So those are the six elements. <clears throat> and the question is, is this group cyclic? Is there a generator? And it turns out that one, one is in fact a generator because one, one plus one, one, because we're in an addition group, not multiplication, is equal to two, two, which is zero, two. And then zero, two plus one, one is equal to one, zero. And then one, zero plus one, one is equal to uh, zero, one. And zero, one plus one, zero. Uh, sorry, plus one, one, not one, zero, plus one, one. Plus one, one is one, two. And then finally, one, comma, two plus one, comma, one is equal to zero, zero. And so you had to add it six times, right? So one, uh, so that's squared to the third, fourth, fifth, six, and so the order of one, one was six. The order of one, comma, one is six. And so there's six elements. And so therefore, Z2 direct product Z3 is isomorphic to Z6, right? The isomorphism that takes the, the element one, comma, one gets mapped to the element one is an iso. <clears throat> you could prove that to yourself, but um, it's not that hard to show that's one to one and on two. And then operation preserving, I just, I mean, I basically just did it, right? <clears throat> but we can also use the fact that every cyclic group is isomorphic to Z6. This is an element. This is a cyclic group of six things in. So that's the idea. Um, and actually, we can use this fact to now classify all groups of order four. So if I give you an arbitrary group of order four, you can have the identity, two elements that necessarily don't have to be different, and then their product, right? That's uh, what has to be in there. And then if... if uh, the element of a so if g is if g has an element of order four so if g has an element of order four it is cyclic it is cyclic and isomorphic to z4 right that one's easy that's kind of like the the question i did earlier so it's cyclic group is therefore a billion so assume it doesn't. So assume not. So assume it doesn't. It doesn't. <clears throat> so therefore, every non-identical element, A, is equal to the order of B, is ordered to the equal of their product, which is equal to 2. They all have to have order 2. Every non-identical element has order 2. This is very similar to the uh, midterm, actually. And then the idea is that you actually have a isomorphism from Z2, direct sum Z2, and what we're going to do is uh, we'll send, um, so there's an isomorphism. So G is isomorphic to there. And the map is going to send the element A gets mapped to the thing 1, 0. B is going to get mapped to the thing 0, 1. And then their product will get mapped to 1, 1. And so the claim is that this is an isomorphism. This is operation preserving. <coughs> And those are the only options. You either have an element of order four or every element has order two. And in that case, it's Z2 cross Z2. This is called the Klein fear group of. So Z2 direct product Z2 is called the Klein fear group of. The Klein fear, which means four fear group of. Um, I actually don't remember why it's called that. But it's it's a special because it's the only non-cyclic group of order four. There's and there's only two groups. There's the Z4 and then Z2 direct some Z2. And so I just remember learning about this in my in my first German class. Or not my German class, but it I guess I did learn fear and group in German. But um and I actually don't know if this Klein means small. I think this or if it's about the the or if it's about the mathematician Klein, Felix Klein. Hmm. I should look into the uh um, the history behind why it's called this, the Klein fear group, but we a lot of times call it V. And so you have Z4 and you have Z2, direct product Z2, and those are the only two. Um, and so something we notice here is that Z4 and Z2, direct product Z2 are not equivalent. 
So Z4 is not isomorphic to Z2, direct product Z2. But sometimes if you have Z of a number times a number, it is isomorphic to ZM, direct product ZN. And then sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't, just like above. Sometimes it ain't. And so the, the, the question is when? When can you write a product of um, two numbers, so Z, a cyclic group with two things? When is that really, can it be written as a direct product and when can't it? Um, and so kind of help us on that. We're gonna talk about what the orders of elements are in a direct product. And so we come to a little theorem <clears throat> that's very reminiscent of the orders of, uh, what is it? Um, disjoint cycles, uh, disjoint cycle notation, right? The idea is that if you have an element G1 comma all the way to GN, the order of that element in the, in the direct product is actually the least common multiple of the order of each individual element. And the proof is actually not too bad. So let's do it. So let's let T be equal to the order of this element, G1 comma dot, 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 GN. So that's the order of it. And let and let S equal the LCM of the following set, the orders of all the individual elements, G1 dot 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 G N. My claim is that those are the same. And so we're going to show that they're less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. So to show that S is less than or equal to two, so let's consider so, so S is a product of all the orders of the G's. And so if I raise, so consider, consider the, the element G1, G2, dot, 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 Gn raised to the S. Well, by definition, that means raise every single element to the S power, because you just do it in each component. But then S is the least common multiple of all the orders. In particular, it is a multiple of every one of these orders. And so this is equal to the identity. And so therefore, so thus, and remember T is the order of this guy. So this thing has to be greater than or equal to it. So thus S is greater than or equal to T. <clears throat> but now let's look at G raised to the T. So G, so G1, G2, now, g1, g2, dot, 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 g to the n, if you raise that to the t, that's the same as raising each individual one to the t, g2 to the t, dot, 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 g n to the t. But because we know that t is the order of this element, this has to be the identity element in the direct product, which is just a bunch of e's. But what does that tell us? That tells us that for each one of these, t must be a multiple of the orders of all of these, right? Because the only way that G1 raised to the T, G2 raised to the T, and GN to the T is that if T is a multiple of all their things, in particular, so T must be a multiple, must be a multiple of the orders because it's it's simultaneously killing all of them. And so it must be some multiple of them, must of the orders of the G sub I. But if T is a multiple of the orders and S is the least common multiples, then S, then S must be less than or equal to T. Then S must be less than or equal to T. But if you have S is greater than or equal to T and S is less than or equal to T, therefore S equals T and we're done. And so the order of an element really is the least common multiple of the uh, orders of the elements themselves. And so let's do an example. So number of elements of order five in Z25 times our direct proxy five. So this group has 25 things and this thing has five things. And so the total order is 125. There's 125 guys in here and elements of order five. So in order, in order for what does a generic guy look like? A comma B for A to B to have order five, the least common multiple. I don't know why I decided to put dots now. I'm just gonna say LCM. LCM of the order of A and order of B must be five. <clears throat> must be five, right? That's by the theorem. And so where does A come from? A comes from a cyclic group of order 25 and B comes uh, from a cyclic group of order five. 
and we want their orders to have least common multiple of five. And so what are the possibilities? So possibilities that make least common multiple of five. Possibilities, well, what are the possibilities? The order of A could be one, and order of B could be five. The order of A could be five, and the order of B could be one, and then the order of A could be five, and the order of B could be five. <clears throat> Those are really the kind of three distinct possibilities. And so let's enumerate them and try each one individually. So case one, so order of A equals one and order of B equals five. So how many different ways can we do that? Well, there's only one element. So only one element of order one, I, namely the identity, which is uh, in this case zero. And then how many elements of order five are there in Z5? In Z5, there are four, which is equal to the phi, the phi Euler function of five, um, elements of order five order five. And that's actually true in any cyclic group. In any cyclic group, there's only going to be four elements of order five um, because the Euler phi function of five is always four. And so thus, thus four elements in this case. Elements in this case. Uh, let's do the case where the order of A equals five and the order of B um, equals one or five. Let's just do it like that. Um, cause it's kind of annoying to, to do the, the, the one case separately. It's basically the same thing. Um, it's just, you add one thing to it. And so, um, two, and then I guess also three, I'm just going to do them together in one kind of thing. Um, and so B is one or five. Uh, so how do we do this? How many elements of order five are there? In, so in Z 25, there are four elements of order five, same as in Z5, order five. Um, do you know what they are? Uh, so just a reminder, they're the elements five, 10, 15, and 20. Those guys all have order five. Um, and then in Z5, uh, in Z5, every element, element is order one or five, element is order one or five, five and so we get four times five so four times five um, possibilities because for each element in z25 we compare it with all five and so you get four times five possibilities which equals 20. so 20 20 elements in this case in these cases and so we get so total total is totat total the total is just going to be four plus 20 which is 24 elements of order five and it actually wouldn't be that much work to actually list all what they all are um you're going to have basically the order the identity plus all the non-identity elements in b or in z5 and then you're going to have uh all of these elements five with every element in Z5, 10 with every element in Z5, 15 and 20. And then, so that will give you all 24 possibilities, but I won't go through that. <clears throat> and so this is a really fun kind of counting argument, but the basic idea is you need to figure out how many ways can you get the least common multiple of orders to be the order that you want it to be. So you think about all possibilities and then you list out how many elements are in each possibility. Sometimes they go easier together. Like whenever you have the identity, it's just one thing. And so really you can just lump it up with another thing. And so that's what they do in the book. And it's what I did too. Let's do it in a slightly um, more nuanced example. We're going to ratchet it up a little bit. So now we're going to find number of cyclic subgroups of order 10 in Z100 direct product Z25. So the order of this, by the way, so the order of Z100 direct product Z25 is 25 times 100, which is 2,500. There are 2,500 elements in this group, right? That's a lot. Um, but it's actually not going to be that hard to find the number of cyclic subgroups of order 10. Um, we're actually going to be able to find how many of them. And the key idea, so key idea is this. Key idea 
idea. The cyclic subgroups, the cyclic subgroups of order 10, subgroups of order 10 contain all the elements of order 10. Why is that the case? Well, because if you take an element of order 10, you take the subgroup generated by it, it gives you a cyclic subgroup of order 10. And so they all have to be gotten that way. And so every element of order 10 is going to be in one of these. And in particular, they will not overlap. Contain all the elements of order 10 and, and distinct ones and distinct, distinct subgroups, subgroups will only overlap in the identity. Because if they're distinct subgroups, right, and they're both cyclic subgroups generated by an element, then once you have one's A, so, I mean, kind of quick little argument for why this is true. If you have one of them as A, looks like A to the K, and this is, so let me see it like this. So one of them is like generated by an element A, and I'm saying it's equal to a guy, um, it's not equal to some cyclic general group B and they're both order 10. <clears throat> Why is it that they can only intersect in the identity? Well, and with order of A equal order B equal 10. And so there's going to actually be uh, four different generators in this one and four different generators in that because that's what the Euler fee function of 10 is. But anyways, why are these things, if they're not equal, um, why can they only inter intersect the identity? Well, this is all powers of A. And if, uh, so what this group looks like is A1 all the way to A10. And then what this guy looks like is uh, B1 all the way to B10. I guess B is A0 to A9 and B0 to B9. And if these groups are not different, then there's some element that's different from each other. And uh, all... Uh, if these guys are distinct, meaning that they don't match exactly these guys, every element in here is killed uh, by 10. And every element in here is killed by 10. And then, actually, I guess we can say, we can't say this, they will only overlap in the identity. And distinct subgroups, the generators will, will contain, and distinct subgroups will only, will each contain will each <clears throat> contain uh, the Euler phi of 10, which equals four distinct generators, distinct generators. And so the idea there is that if they're distinct groups, so that means they're, they're, they're separate from each other, not exactly the same, um, or if they're different groups and they're both order 10, every generator generates the whole group and so if they contained any overlap in their generators, they would have to, then the subgroups have to be contained in one another and it's equal to the same. Um, and so if, if A is an element of B, then that subgroup would have to be contained in B and vice versa and vice versa. And so that's kind of the, the argument. So that's a... So thus, A is not in B for all generators A, for all generators, generators A. That's kind of the idea. Um, so the generators are going to be in there. And so for every, so the analogy of the book uses is that you're trying to count sheep or the cyclic subgroup of the sheep by counting their four legs. And so are you, I guess you want to count um, yeah, you want to count sheep by counting their legs. And so you kind of group them up in four because there's four distinct generators for each sheep or each cyclic subgroup, sorry. So what we need to do, so that means we need to find all the elements of our units. So thus, need to find all elements of order 10. Of order 10. And so just like before, we need to figure out how many different ways can we have an element in here. So... So A, B is an element of Z100, direct product Z25, with order of A, uh, with their least common multiple, with LCM 
of the order of A, order B, equal to 10. So how many different ways could we do that? So order of A could be one. Actually, it can't be one, right? Because if it's one, the divisors of this are five and 25 and one, and so it can't be one. And so this has to be two. Two, and so case one, the order of A could be two, and the order of B could be uh, five, or it could be 10, right? It could be five or 10. Either one of those cases would work. Um, and so how many different ways? Well, there's only one. So only one element of order two, order two. And then how many elements of order five do we have? And four elements of order five elements of order five. And uh, I believe it's also four elements of order 10 because the Euler feet, the number of things relatively prime to 10 is also four. And four elements of uh, order 10. So, and those are different. And so that means we get um, one times eight. So eight elements in that case. Case two, <clears throat> we could have the order of A, B, five, and then an order of B, B, not five anymore, it has to be 10, because if it was five, the least common multiple would be five. And so in this case, we have four possibilities in A times four possibilities in B, which equals 16 elements. And then case three, the order of A could be, uh, can it be 10? Yeah, we can't be 10. And then in that case, the order of B could be one, five, or 10. So it could be all three. And so we're gonna have four possibilities for A and then how many things are one, order one, five, or 10? I guess 10 is not, I messed up because there's no there's no elements of order 10 in here. So actually that's gone. That's gone because there's no elements of order 10 in there. Whoops, that was silly of me. Um, and so this is four elements. And then this is 16 elements. This is still right. Wait, actually, no, you can't even do this. So this case doesn't even exist. I'm so sorry. I totally messed this up. Because B is, is Z25. There's no elements over that. So this case doesn't even make sense. So if the order of A is 5, then it doesn't work. It's really just this case right here. There's only two cases. Um, and order of B is 1 or 5. Those are really the only ways to do it. I'm so sorry. So four elements. So how many things do we have in this? We have four for A. And then how many possibilities do we have for B? Um, we have one element of order one and then four elements of order five. And so five. And so 20 elements. And so, so 24 total elements of order 10. Total elements of order 10. Which you should know is not the same thing as the Euler fee number, right? The Euler fee number would be would be four in this case, and so it's more than that. And I'm not sure actually what the relationship is with like the number of elements of order ten here and order ten here, but I just know how to do a counting like this where you use least where you use least common multiples. But anyways, we have twenty four total elements of order ten. Each one of those for e each subgroup, each subgroup contains contains exactly four contains exactly four elements of order 10, four elements of order 10, or four generators. So we have 24 divided by four, which is six cyclic subgroups. 24 divided by four, which equals six cyclic subgroups. Subgroups of order 10. That one would be much harder to find what they are, but we know there's six of them. So that's kind of cool. Just using some simple counting arguments, we can do that. Okay, 
let's look at when direct products are cyclic. And I think we, we built up most of the machinery. And so G direct product H or direct sum, sorry, I said direct product, but direct sum, uh, or do they call it direct product? I don't remember. Internal direct product, internal direct sum. I use direct sum, direct product. They mean the same thing. Sorry, but um, direct sum is technically, I guess, for internal and direct product is more external. I think that's kind of the difference. And so I should call it a product. But anyways, let G and H be finite cyclic groups. Then G direct product H is cyclic if and only if the orders are relatively prime. And so let's prove it. Let's prove it this way first. So let's assume that, so assume that GH is cyclic, um, that G, whoops, that G direct product H is cyclic. And let's call the order of G direct product H, direct product H, let's call that order M times N. And so we know that there's some element um, of order m times m. So let little g h be an element of g direct product h such that g h raised to the m n equals the identity. And that's the smallest. And then let's let's assume let's call let's uh let let d be the gcd the gcd of the orders of g and h uh so let that be the gcd of the order of g i guess the order of g is m and the order of h is n so of m n we want to prove that d equals one and so notice that because d divides both m and n that g h raised to the m n divided by d because that's a it divides both of them is equal to g to the m n divided by d comma h to the m n divided by d but then because it's a divisor this is equal to g raised to the m to the n divided by d and this is h to the n m divided by d but that implies that this is the identity so thus, uh, mn divided by d is smaller than mn. So mn, mn divided by d must be uh, greater than or equal to mn because mn is the least it could do. But that only way, so that implies, so therefore, d equals 1. The only way that can be possible is if d is 1 because we found something smaller than mn that killed G and H, and so um, it's not possible. And so D had to be one to go the other way. This is a much. This is a really simple. Um, let G generate big G, and little H generate big H, and assume assume that their GCD, the GCD of M N equals one. So if the greatest common divisor of M and N equals one, then that implies then, then the least common multiple then of the order of G and order of H has to equal the least common multiple of M and N. But because their GCD is one, the smallest thing that they can multiply to be is MN. As MN, is mn, but this then equals the order of g comma h. But that equals the order of the whole group. So cyclic, so cyclic. And so that's the idea, it's not too bad. Um, it's just some, some counting arguments and using the power of GCD and least common multiples. Uh, the nice thing about this, this, we did it for two things. But you can but you could ratchet this up using induction. So it can use induction, induction to get the following, to get the following. And so the idea is just do it uh, inductively. And so it's actually good practice in induction to try and prove this. Um, it's not hard. It's just using an induction argument, but uh, it's boring and I don't want to do it. 
Um, corollary two is exactly this corollary, just be rewritten in the terms of Z of the Z groups. And so a Z group is cyclic if and only if all of these guys are relatively prime. And so the, the consequence of this is that there's lots of ways to rewrite the same thing. So for instance, Z6 is isomorphic to Z2, direct product Z3, because they are of different order. And then Z24 is isomorphic to Z, uh, so we need them to be non um, Z8, direct product Z3, but it's not necessarily isomorphic to Z4, direct product Z2, um, direct product Z3, because those guys are not relatively prime. Um, and it's not necessarily isomorphic to Z2, direct product Z2, direct product Z2, direct product Z3. And so there's a lot of different things that it could be. Um, let me do another example. Z30 can be written as Z6, direct product Z5. But Z6 can be broken up even further. It could be written as Z2, direct product Z3, direct product Z5. But then I can combine Z15, Z3 and Z15, so Z2, direct product Z15. And so they're all isomorphic. And so it kind of tells you a little about the structure, right? That this tells you there's going to be some element of order two, right? Just take one and then zeros here. There's some element of order three, some element of order five. It also tells you there's an element of order six. And it also tells you there's an element of order 30. And there's an element of order 15. And so you can get almost every single one because this is a cyclic group. But if it's not cyclic, then we can't say it. For instance, in this group, Z2 direct product, Z2 direct product, Z2, Z3, there is no element of order four in here because there's no way to get fours to be the least common multiple of those things. And so <clears throat> that's kind of nice. Um, and there's a lot of playing around with this and, and we can play with that more later. And then finally, I want to talk about the U groups. And so what happens with the U groups? Um, I need to introduce some notation. So U sub K of N, this is going to be a subgroup of UN where you take all the elements in UN such that X mod K, so the K comes from here, equals 1. So in particular, U sub 7 of 105 is 1, 8, 22, 29, 43, 64, 71, 92. So U 105 actually has, I think, 28 elements in it or something. And then these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these eight elements um, are the ones that are all relatively prime to seven. Um, I won't make a huge deal of this, but a nice thing, a nice consequence of this, I'm not gonna prove this, is that U of two numbers times each other is actually isomorphic to U of S direct product U of T if S and T are relatively prime. So this is very key, they have to be relatively prime. And that you get these like U sub S of ST is isomorphic to UT. At this one, I'm not that, that big a deal. But anyways, so like for instance, U of 105. That's going to be the direct product of, I think, 3 and 35. 3 direct product 35, um, which is 15. But that doesn't work. So it has to be, I think, uh, so I think it's 3 times 5 times 7. And so you can write this as the direct product of U3, direct product U, um, U5, I guess U35, U35. But then U35 can be rewritten as the direct product of U3, direct product U5, direct product U7. And so similar to like the Zs, we can kind of break them up. And so I guess I didn't really talk about how direct products are associative, but it doesn't really matter what order you're doing. So you can break it down into its smallest parts. But actually, we can do even better than this. And so we're going to, so because we may not know what U3, U5, and U7 are, but using this kind of decomposition, if we know how to kind of decompose the prime ones, then we can actually figure out what these groups are. They also talk about this, but I don't make it do. And so that is we can do even better. We can write them as a product of cyclic groups, in particular the disease. And this is the kind of algorithm. So using the fact that U2 is 0, U4 is Z2, and then U2 to the N is Z2, direct product Z2 to the N minus 2. And then U to any prime is going to be Z to the prime N minus 1 minus prime to the N minus, or prime to the N minus prime to the N minus 1. And so this is true for any prime. And so using this, we can do anything. So let's go back to U105. So U105, we know, is isomorphic to U3, 
direct product u5, direct product u7, but each one of those is a prime. And so this is each, each one of these is isomorphic to, this is z2, direct product z4, direct product z6. And so we know exactly what this group is, and we can't actually combine this any further because none of those are relatively prime to each other. And so that's it. Um, we could do U720. So U720 is isomorphic to U of, I don't know, what 72 written as? It's 72 times 10. And 72 is 6 times 12. So it's like 6 times 12 times 10. Um, but what is that? Uh, there's a five, two sixes. So it's like five times. So I want to collect all the powers. So there's a five, there's one five. Uh, there's how many twos? One, two, three, so eight. So 40 times, then how many threes? Uh, 40 times, I think there are two threes. So it might have been, so if that's nine, so that's 360. So I need two more, so it's like 16 actually right here. So 16. All of those are relatively prime to each other. And so I can write this as u5, direct sum u16, direct sum u9, and then I can use these rules up here to kind of write those down. And so this is going to be z4, direct product, u16 is 2 to the 4th, and so this is going to be z2, direct product, z to the 2 raised to the 2, and so z4, and then I think that's right, yeah, and then u9 will be uh, z to the 3, 9, minus 3, and so that's z6, because z to the 9, um, and then minus one more power, so yeah, so it's z6. And so that's what we get. Uh, and so in particular, the order of z of u720 is just 4 times 2 times 4 times 6, and so what is that? 24, 48, 48 times 4 is, oh gosh, 48 times 4 is 196. And so this thing has order 196, and we know exactly what structure is. We know what the element orders could be, and so on and so forth. And so this is something we'll play with later. All right, I'll call it there, and we'll start uh, chapter 9 on Wednesday. All right, have a good one.